Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University, and today I have another special guest on the channel. I've got uh, Mark Balin here from the Bounties Network uh, to talk about his project. Um, so welcome Mark, we're here at uh, ETH Memphis conference this weekend, having a good time uh, giving some presentations and attending some talks, and we just got out of a, a big talk, so we're uh, ready to kind of uh, chat and um, yeah, welcome, Mark. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to chat. I love talking about uh, Ethereum applications and why they matter. So yeah, yeah. to do this. Very cool. So um, before I start, you know, kind of bombarding you with questions here, uh, do you want to kind of just give your elevator pitch for Bounties Network? And yeah. Kind of like what you guys are working on? Sure. Yeah. So uh, bounties obviously have existed for thousands of years. Uh, most often, you know, bounties on people's heads. <laughs> uh, for you know more recently, people have started putting bounties on bugs and code. Uh, but the, the key is that the bounties network lets you put a bounty on any task. And so you can think about it as the incentivization layer on Ethereum where you know if you can incentivize a group of individuals uh, to or, or individuals themselves to complete a certain task, you can pay them using any token on Ethereum. Awesome. And so this is the promise of the Bounties Network, and we're currently exploring different verticals that bounties are, are useful for, uh, and, and we're seeing some pretty tremendous growth. So uh, yeah, we're excited to, to see the world on bounties and how people will use bounties to uh, incentivize each other to do different tasks. Awesome. So I mean, if I'm understanding this correctly, so you have something where like you have a task of some kind, mm -hmm. and someone completes this task, and then they're you know rewarded with... Um, the cryptocurrency. So is it, is it a token, is it an Ethereum token of their choice or how does that work? Yeah, so people can put up bounties in whatever token they like. Uh, some people use Ether, some people use DAI, which is like a stable coin on Ethereum. Uh -huh. uh, and some people use their token, like their own native token. So some projects, uh, for example, we had Augur put up a bounty uh, in, in REP tokens, which is their native token. Uh, and actually based off of the volatility of REP, uh, the price of the, or the, the value of that bounty actually increased. And so uh, you have this interesting like alignment of incentives where people who are now like typically when you pay a freelancer you pay them with fiat cash and so sure. you know what they get is you know just that the money, uh, but when you pay someone with with tokens and native tokens for whatever project they're contributing to, you sort of align the incentives of the freelancer and the firm so that they are you know incentivized to be sort of optimizing for the same thing. Awesome. So, how do these bounties like work under the hood? Are these all smart contract based? Like, how does, how does that work? Yeah. So, uh, on under the hood, uh, we have a set of smart contracts that manage and facilitate the bounty. So, the actual like payment uh, and and sort of on chain registry of um, the 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 tasks themselves and the submissions that people have made and the deliverables. Um, but on top of that, we also use IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system, uh, for actual like auxiliary storage of those deliverable files of any data associated like requirements or a description of the bounty. Uh, and so we use this sort of double layer of decentralized technologies uh, to enable these these bounties to be cross-listed across many platforms simultaneously. And so the this is the whole thing with the bounties network where not only do we have this like platform that people can go to bounties.network to actually create and issue bounties, but we also work with other websites um, like Gitcoin, Cowery, and others to actually integrate with them as well. So um, those are websites that are focused Gitcoin on open source bounties and Cowery for documentation and knowledge work bounties. Uh, but the key is that when you create a bounty on one of these sites, they automatically propagate to all these other sites as well. And so this is you know only possible because we use these decentralized technologies that no single party is administering, but um, we're all sort of collaborating on standards. Awesome. So that's the idea of like the network it being multiple things and you could have a standard for how these things work. Exactly. Yeah. And you can also, you know, and we're trying to think forward uh, how you might have networks of bounties where um, bounties actually feed into sub bounties and, and so forth. So larger tasks can be split into smaller tasks that maybe specialists might be able to work on instead of just one person per task. Awesome. So, you know, all the bounties that you all have started with now, um, are these all are these all tasks that are completed on chain or verifiable on chain? So, actually most of them are not verifiable on chain. Uh, the key is that verifiability uh, is still done by the issuer of the bounty. So, if I 
you know, put out a task. People can submit a deliverable or proof that they've completed that task, uh, and then I will actually have to accept it. And so that uh, actual like acceptance and the, the transmission of the funds does happen on chain, uh, but there's no way to automatically verify that a piece of code is correct. You might have, you know, it might pass some tests, but, uh, and that one, and code is actually much, much easier to codify the acceptance of the bounty. But, you know, for example, with a graphic design and, and a logo, uh, how could you possibly automate the sure. process of accepting, you know, a logo? Sure. Awesome. Very cool. So, you know, you mentioned uh, a few verticals that the bounties are, uh, you know, currently offered in. Uh, you know, you mentioned Gitcoin mm -hmm. and code or, or maybe just some, uh, Thing, you know, some quick wins, right? St stuff that like economies that people are already familiar with uh, exchanging work in, freelance services, graphic mm -hmm. design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where do you see this going? And, and you know, how far can you take this idea? Like, you know, yeah. Where can that go? So, uh, we, so we're sort of started on that freelancing layer and thinking about what tasks people are already trying to outsource. Uh -huh. um, so code is a big one. Graphics are a big one. Translations are a big one, especially in the crypto economics or cryptocurrency space where, you know, people need translations in other languages internationally. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to think ahead and, and we've actually been running around and asking people, you know, if you could bounty anything in the world, what would you bounty? And the key is to get people thinking about, you know, if they could incentivize people around the world to, to complete any task, what that task would be. Uh, and so an interesting one that we've heard uh, recently was we were speaking to a Grammy Award winning artist and he said he wanted music bounties, which is cool, which is basically um, you have all these you know, musicians who are around the world who have instruments who don't play professionally anymore, but they're still very talented. And so if they could make money off of playing um, and contributing to the creation of music tracks for producers or um, or in general for, for uh, the production of various types of media that need background music, uh, you could sort of activate a lot of just, dis dis you know, musicians that are not formally you know, who are maybe formally trained, but who aren't formally practicing um, musicians as a, as their trade, sure. uh, but who can still you know make money off of that. Um, that's another one. But the most interesting one I want to talk about is uh, bounties to save the rainforest, and this one's really cool because, uh, and this was the one we got from someone else. And the premise is that you could take, uh, let's say, a square plot of, of rainforest land, let's say, in the Amazon, um, and you know, using satellite imagery, we can see that you know if the forest is still intact. And so what you could do is issue this bounty and say, I will pay you, you know, let's say $500 or $1,000 every six months uh, if that rainforest is intact, remains intact. And so, and, and, and all, the key to this problem is that we just need to find sort of stakeholders on the ground who we can give, you know, private keys to and, and give them an Ethereum wallet and say, look, this will be your wallet. You can now generate wealth, um, you know, through, through bounties, through maintaining your land um, or the rainforest rather than having it be deforested uh, for use in, in, you know, monocrop farming. And so, and the key, and so this solves one of those key problems with deforestation, where these communities need capital, or, or you know, they de they desire to, to have some wealth, um, but you know, they they don't want to you know destroy their habitats or, or the forests around them. And so, um, and 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 the cool thing is that you can then have people contributing directly to these efforts rather than through like an NGO or a charity, where. You know, if there's a bounty to save a certain plot of rainforest, I can contribute directly to that bounty, and I know that 100% of the funds that I'm contributing are going directly to those stakeholders on the ground in the community who are actually making that happen, rather than to some you know charity who needs to spend a subset of it for marketing or administrative purposes. Awesome, that's very cool. I, yeah, that, it seems like there can be all kinds of these use cases that come up that uh, start surfacing mm -hmm. when you realize that there are certain. Uh, you know, incentives that you can provide people that we didn't uncover before. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I think the key is that it's become easier to incentivize the action you want to see, right. and so it forces people to ask, okay, well, you know, if I could incentivize anything, what would that be? Right. Um, and, and that's a very difficult question to ask people, uh, and it usually stumps people for quite a long time. Uh, but I actually want to, I want to ask you, if I can reverse this, this uh, interview, sure. if you could bounty anything in the world, what would you bounty? Ooh, that's a good question, and one that I haven't thought of. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So if I could bounty anything in the world, um, it would probably be. I mean, honestly, I think the Gitcoin idea is a great idea. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could if you could bounty um, working code, mm -hmm. you could bounty something that was uh, you could verify with automation that it worked. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like that's a lot closer to being done completely on chain. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's so close, like we're much closer than that than if you than automating something else, right? right. Um, yeah, that that'd be very cool. Cool. Yeah. So I want to hand back to you. If you <laughs> no, I questions. appreciate that. Yeah, I, I like that. Uh, that's probably the first time someone has uh, reversed the interview process on me. I like it. Um, okay, yeah. So one thing we've talked about a little bit this weekend at the conference um, is encouraging developers who are coming into the space, because uh, mostly who's, who's watching this are, are developers, um, who are trying to figure out what to do with Ethereum. Encouraging them, you know, not just to think about what you can do with a smart contract as, you know, uh, uh, just doing the same thing that you would do in a centralized way just on the blockchain, right? right? Um, but actually trying to think about, like, crypto economics a little bit mm -hmm. and, and how that plays into um, building decentralized applications. And, you know, we talked about a little, a little bit about incentives. Mm. And some people are maybe scared of that word or don't even know what it is. Like, so if you had to give a really quick definition of, like, what crypto economics is and how to, like, how you all are thinking about that mm. and how programmers should be thinking about that. Oh, that's three questions, but yeah. give you a little something to chew on. So crypto economics, in my opinion, is the use of... Uh, public and private key cryptography uh, to facilitate these games uh, where, you know, to the, to the effect of some benefit or some goal. Sure. And so um, obviously this doesn't require a token explicitly, although it could, you know, use one. Um, oftentimes it requires the use of signed messages, whether it's transactions or, or messages themselves as part of the system. Um, but most importantly, it requires the use of these games. And we call them these like incentive games where, you know, you're really trying to program humans, um, as, you know, sometimes rational humans, oftentimes irrational humans, uh, and to understand what they're, what they're optimizing for, whether it's just value, whether it's reputation or something else, uh, and how you can almost manipulate them or, or encourage them to, to converge on some um, goal, which is, you know, to the benefit of the system right. that, that you're designing. And so this is the whole thing about Bitcoin, which was that, you know, they wanted the goal, the end goal was the to have a ledger of transactions, uh, you know, of peer to peer electronic cash. And so what they did is they aligned all of these different actors, the incentives of all these different actors, uh, together so that to make this system work because you know most of these systems don't require just one actor or even two but sometimes three three or more and 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 those become very difficult and so right. to to manage to ideate and to, to administer and so um coming up with these games where everybody's interests are aligned with the benefit of um the of the goal or or, or to the the furthering of that goal that's how you like make you know your goal achievable basically right, right? and so um, getting cooperation exactly yeah but it's but it's even it's like competition to achieve the goal almost or you can have competition among certain actors uh, which sort of subconsciously entails collaboration because they're right. collaboratively working towards this goal while also competing I heard a really great term for this uh, by a good friend of mine called it cooperation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot of that uh, where people are like cognizant of the fact that they're you know, very explicitly competing, right. but also very much collaborating. All uh, ships rise. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the water raising all boats. Yeah. It, yeah. Like it, it really happens. Uh, and so that, that I think is very important. And in terms of for, you know, developers to understand, um, Crypto economics is sort of this like mechanism design. A lot of people describe it as like reverse game theory because game theory is you know the study of you of, of analyzing systems uh, and understanding the incentives of different actors and, and trying to find basically the the shelling point or, or equilibrium that um, actors will that, that that might arise when actors try to um, further their best interests. Right. And so mechanism design flips that and says, okay, well, how can we you know, design a game where we know what the end goal is, but we don't know what the incentives will be. Uh, and so we want to try to program those incentives and program the humans, basically, um, to achieve that goal. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I, I, really, I really like that. Um, so, you know, how could... How can programmers think about this? Like if they're coming into the space and like keeping this in one hand and then keeping like, like they kind of have to learn two things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you have to learn like how to make a smart contract work and like how to, how to you know, use the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, maybe like what's one little tidbit of wisdom you can like give to someone who's trying to think about how to how to build new projects on this kind of stuff. Um, so this is less crypto economics related and more. I know a lot of people struggle. They like get really excited about you know Ethereum and they want to build something, but they don't really know what to build. Right. Um, my advice in, in in terms of finding an idea or finding a problem space you find interesting, and this is one I've actually used personally, um, is is focus on you know, the types of transactions or the types of mechanisms which were usually only available to large institutions. Okay. Uh, and the key is that usually those mechanisms or transactions are only possible because the, for or only available for large institutions because they're very expensive right. to administer. And usually right. they're like centrally administered. Right. And so if you can sort of understand uh, these types of transactions that are, you know, exclusively used by institutions, figure out if they might be valuable for humans, you know, in a peer-to-peer -peer economy type of, of system, um, you can uh, sort of rebuild those institutional uh, transactions for peer, for, for individuals, for humans, uh, in a much cheaper manner using, using smart contracts and decentralized systems. And so I think that's a good way to think about it is that um, blockchains make, blockchains bring to people what used to be reserved for large institutions. Uh, and large institutions will continue having the capital for, to pay for this, you know, even before blockchain and after. Um, but for a lot of people, a lot of different types of services will now become available only because they're offered on decentralized, right. um, you know, blockchains. So part of maybe the uh, decentralized benefit is just lowering the barrier of entry for, for people who want to make things. Yeah, and lowering the barrier of entry and lowering the cost and, you know, um, hopefully aligning the incentives of many actors, like I said. And that's usually a key part of it, is that instead of it just being one actor who centrally administers something, you can have several actors coming together to achieve that goal. And that's sort of the hard part of the problem, is how do you how do, you do that? But um, it's, a, it's a very fun space to be in, as, as I find it. Uh, and and it's, it's exciting because it's this mix of like, research uh, into into you know crypto, crypto economics or mechanism design but at the other hand you know very much applied um, obviously in the context of implementing these mechanisms and smart contracts but actually also being able to test them with real users in, in the real world very cool very cool so um, yeah that's that's awesome so uh, with the bounties network um, is there kind of anything exciting on the roadmap that you might share with the people watching yeah so uh, we're doing some interesting experiments with uh, community-based bounties networks where, you know, communities of individuals might come together around a particular token or something mm -hmm. uh, to to achieve, like I said, some goal or, or to fulfill some bounties or have some task allocation, which is cool. Uh, but what we're most excited about is um, our expansion into uh, new product sort of lines. So bounties on, like I said, graphics or music even, or, or translations. Uh, and then further, the development of Delphi, which is a mechanism for decentralized staking and arbitration. Uh, and basically alleviates a lot of the trust problems that occur with bounties, like I said, because a lot of them still do require humans to verify the work. Um, you know, with, with a system like Delphi, you could have uh, trust offset to third parties uh, powered by sort of a stake that you have sitting there. So, you know, you don't have to worry about trusting an individual. You can just trust the arbiters who are able to, uh, you know, adjudicate claims against that stake. Sure. Awesome. Very cool. Well, Mark, um, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. It's been very illuminating, and I hope that a lot of people have uh, uh, learned uh, a lot from, from watching this. I know I sure have. Um, just so in case people aren't aware, uh, where can we find the Bounties Network online? So, you know, obviously our website is bounties.network. Uh, we're on Twitter at Eat Bounties, and, and most importantly, we're on Slack. Uh, so you can actually find links to join our Slack on both our Twitter and our website. Uh, but that's probably the best place to, to reach out and talk to us. And, you know, we love chatting about you know, asking that same question, what would you bounty if you could bounty anything in the world? And so uh, we want you to tell us so we can actually not only build systems to, to enable that, but actually potentially put up those bounties ourselves. So uh, please feel free to join our Slack. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, as, um, yeah, before we wrap up here, I mean, is there anything else that uh, you'd like for the people watching to know? Um, your... Crypto economic design probably doesn't need a token, and that's okay. <laughs> awesome. I like that. Very cool. Well, Mark, uh, again, it's been a pleasure. Um, hope everyone has enjoyed this as much as I have. 
Uh, so be sure to subscribe to the channel for more conversations like this where I'm talking to people like uh, Mark who are building things on top of Ethereum. And until then, thanks for watching Bath University. Thank you.